Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival's Hawaii 2.0, Shaping Our Future Conference, uh, which is running till November 4th in partnership with the University of Hawaii at Manoa. My name is Brian Dote. I'm a mobile app developer by trade. Uh, I love working with startups, so I'm super excited to hear what David has today uh, to share with us today. I've worked in Silicon Valley and also work with local and other US-based tech startups, usually trying to bring their product to market. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the sweet spot that I love to play in. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce two speakers, both of which uh, are in areas that are super exciting to me, so I can't wait to hear their presentations. First up, we have David Clark. He's the executive director of Nalukai Academy. Nalukai produces youth leadership programs focused on technological, social, and cultural entrepreneurship for Hawaii high school students. I wish Nalukai was around when I was in high school. This would have been awesome. <laughs> um, and we hope Neil Sims would join us. He is the founder and CEO of Ocean Era. Uh, they pioneer technologies for high value marine fin fish and uh, reef fish, the offshore culture of tropical macroalgae. Uh, Neil is awesome. He founded a commercial offshore farm for Kampachi in both Hawaii and Mexico. And Neil will be presenting after we go through David's presentation. So for today, we're going to have David Clark present first. We'll follow that up with uh, some QA time, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, depending on where we land. Uh, then we'll go into Neil's presentation, followed by Q&A for Neil. So with that, David, the floor is yours. That's so perfect. good morning. Uh, my name is David Clark. I am the executive director of Nalukai Academy. A little bit of that history. In 2016, it started as the Nalukai Hacker Camp. The name has since changed to Startup Camp um, for some funny reasons. Um, but uh, eventually, basically 20 students were invited to participate in a free residential boarding camp held at Hawaii Preparatory Academy on Hawaii Island that aimed to teach tech entrepreneurship to young people from across the state. Each student was provided a MacBook Pro um, to equip their endeavors, and they got to take that home with them. And um, so far over the years, um, Nalukai has essentially invested um, over $150,000 just in technology and distributing it to young people through the state through our uh, summer startup program. So the final product of that year was a cohort created website that employed the skills of coders, photographers, storytellers, and designers. Then we moved on. Um, during the um, uh, we basically started incorporating, as I got involved, more cultural entrepreneurship uh, because of the many people that I have had a chance to, to work with who are, are deeply invested as cultural practitioners. And we realized that there was some really interesting innovation happening um, in, uh, in indigenous circles. And uh, we, we grew from being a tech entrepreneurship camp to really helping young people um, understand and articulate um, solutions to problems that they saw here in Hawaii. Um, and so over the, uh, over the years, we have grown. Um, we have had now about 140 students go through our program. We've had students from each of the major um, Hawaiian islands, with the exception of Niihau. Um, we have not had a student from there, but we have had Lanai, Molokai, Kauai, Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. Um, we have been lucky to um, have support from uh, organizations like the Hawaii Community Foundation. Um, Alaska Airlines has been really generous with us in, in helping to convene these students, um, bring them together, help them get to know each other really well. Um, so Nalukai's vision, uh, informed and inspired by Hawaii's unique environment and cultural traditions, Nalukai provides training, resources, and intensive entrepreneurial experiences to amplify the impact of Hawaii youth tackling local and global challenges. Here's a picture of um, our, one of our cohorts or some of the members of one of our cohorts working uh, in, industriously um, up at the Hawaii Preparatory Academy Energy Lab, which has been the place that has hosted us um, for, the, uh, for basically the first five years of our existence. Okay, so here's the model that, um, that we use, and um, it's what makes us kind of a unique program. Um, we basically are facilitation teams we always have an industry professional. Um, so from the world of entrepreneurship, our curriculum developer is a good example of that. His name's Austin Stewart. He developed the mobile platform for Twitch from his house in Hilo. Um, and he uh, is our curriculum developer. 
Um, we always have an innovative educator on the team, somebody who is able to take content and make it really relevant to young people. So we have a number of people who have worked in education for their careers. I'm, I am one of them, uh, about a 25 year uh, career in charter schools and in independent schools. Um, and then on top of that, um, we have a cultural practitioner. So we think that there is, is great value if you're doing business in Hawaii to understand the context of doing business in Hawaii, that this is a very unique place and we wanna make sure that students, uh, especially as an educational institution um, that we are, we wanna make sure that students have a great deal of reverence for the culture that is here. Um, and many of them take inspiration from the culture as part of um, the projects that they develop with us. Um, an example of kind of some of the people that we have um, for the last two years, we have had um, uh, Pomai Bertelman um, and Chad Paishan, who've been so involved with the Hokulea and, and uh, the Malama Honua voyage around um, the globe on Hokulea, uh, a real moment of cultural renaissance when that canoe, that sailing canoe, um, pulled back into Honolulu Harbor. The next, one of the next voyages was with Makali'i, which is a big island design, va'a or canoe. And um, Chad and Pomai came and talked to the students about the endeavor that they did, which was taking community gardens and school gardens and employing them to fortify the voyage to the northernmost Hawaiian islands that they did on Makali'i. So how do you engage a community? We make the case that that's a form of entrepreneurship, of cultural entrepreneurship. Um, where they, the first voyages of Hokulea were basically fortified by Costco and lots of canned goods. Um, and they decided that they wanted to fortify it with food grown from Hawaii school children for their voyage. And they, in their six week voyage um, and the two years preceding it, they learned how to can, pickle, salt, dry, and basically take, um, take foods um, and, and uh, produce that was grown on this island and it fortified them for their, for their journey. And it's the next step in some of the voyaging that they're doing. And, and it's, a, it's a way of sort of proving that perhaps Hawaii can be food independent. And that's sort of their next mission uh, after sailing around the world. And so we, um, the students get a chance to work with, with people like that. Um, we've highlighted melee murals and the telling of cultural stories um, through murals. And uh, students visit the Kahilu Theater here who, um, who was, was kind enough to host the Mele Murals Project, um, one of the first ones here. And so students get a chance to, to work with people like that. We start every day with a pico um, or a mana'o kala um, to, or, or sort of concept or word of the day um, that, that corresponds with the curriculum that we're teaching them. So here's the basic overview of what we do. We do um, 10 days of online pre-work where students get to know each other first in an online format. That was very helpful um, that we had that experience when this year we had to go virtual for Nalukai. Um, the first two or three days, we spend time really uh, helping the students get to know each other using social emotional learning and team building activities because we think there's great value in that. Then they go into design thinking and understanding the problem space. So students, um, uh, we take from the student applications, we have a very extensive application process and we ask them to tell us what challenges Hawaii will face in the next 10 years. We take some of those concepts, we bring in experts to help them understand those problem spaces, then they start, they start the design um, thinking um, process, working in close-knit teams since they've got to know each other really well. Um, and then they create and deploy a minimum viable product to test their own assumptions around their own um, visions. And um, we teach a lot of project management at that point and then help facilitate that process with them. Um, after that, uh, they seek feedback and they, and they go into analytics um, using their own social networks as well as cold calling people who are experts in the problem space that they're trying to, to come up with uh, solutions for. And that is one of the most terrifying things for young people these days. The idea of picking up the phone and calling somebody and having a conversation um, and not just texting or emailing. Um, we think there's great value in it and it has been one of those things that's, that's been a surprising um, source of learning and, and challenge for, for the young people. 
um, which has been really great. Then we go into our big pitch day um, where we assemble an audience for them uh, made up of local business people, uh, supportive community members, venture capitalists, and they get a chance to do a formal pitch after we, we teach them the elements of a pitch. And then we have a big celebration. Um, and uh, typically um, we then spend some days talking about now that you've learned this process, which is largely based on um, the Lean Startup methodology as well as some other um, texts. Um, how are you going to take this home? How are you going to bring this to your school and your community? Because as I said, we've now had um, nearly 140 students go through the program coming from 45 different high schools um, around the state. And um, so now these students go back uh, equipped with the ability to start up endeavors, to understand problems better, to understand iterative design and, and uh, the design thinking process. Um, these are some examples of a couple of the uh, of, of three of, uh, of last year's cohorts. Project Lokahi uh, was inspired by um, this team on the left. Uh, the young man especially was, was deeply interested in the activism going on on Mauna Kea. Um, and he wanted to create an app that made it easy for young people to find out about um, social movements in, in Hawaii and how you could be connected with, with demonstrations, um, protests, things like that. Um, really apropos for what's going on in the nation right now. The middle group was interested, um, was inspired by one of the young people's um, grandfather who had diabetes, um, and they realized that, that he didn't necessarily know um, a great deal about how to eat, how to exercise, and so they wanted to create an app that made it easy to, to put students and people in touch with health resources, activity resources. Um, so they created a mobile app for that. The last group was inspired um, by some students who had the chance to work with young people from very uh, economically depressed um, parts of Hawaii and what they realized was not everybody had equal access to technology. So they started a, a company called We Ignite Change, which is about collecting used cell phones, wiping them, loading them with educational software and distributing them to students who wouldn't have access to that otherwise. So these are some of the examples of the social entrepreneurship that our students do. Um, or the cultural entrepreneurship that our students do. And it's, uh, it's very exciting. So thank you thank for your you. presentation today. I'm going to- Thank switch. you. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we'll have Neil Sims. He's the founder and CEO of Ocean Era. Um, and we'll give Neil some time to do his presentation and we'll follow up with Q&A. So Neil, you all set? Thank you very much, Brian. Yes, and, and aloha, Kako. I want to first of all, just introduce Ocean Era because I, I don't know how many Folk, I imagine very few of you are, are familiar with us. We were formerly known as Kampachi Farms, based down here at the Natural Energy Lab in Hawaii. And we recently, at the start of this year, we underwent this name change because whilst we, we do uh, continue on with a lot of R&D work on Seriola or the, the Kampachi, the, the fish that we had originally been working with here in Kona, uh, we're also now starting to work with Kyphosis, which is the Nanue. That's a local reef fish that eats limu and ha has some very compelling uh, reasons, ecological and economic reasons why we're interested in the Nui culture. And then if you're going to grow a fish that eats seaweed, you also need to be able to figure out how to grow the seaweed. And so we, we have an offshore seaweed project under development here. And then we also continue to see ourselves as pioneers in, in the offshore permitting process because we, we've done that here in Hawaii and we also see the need to take that nationally and globally. So I want to speak though today just to focus on Hawaii and uh, its role in, in the development of, of offshore aquaculture innovation both in the nation and globally. Offshore aquaculture may not be familiar to, to everybody here but the concept is just to grow the fish or the oysters or the mussels or the seaweed further offshore in deeper water. And these are examples of where offshore aquaculture is uh, being practiced around the world in various scales and various levels of commercial development. Um, the snapper net pens in Costa Rica and the cobia pens in Panama are full scale commercial projects. There are barramundi projects in Saudi Arabia and Indonesia that are fully commercial. And then a lot of the yellowtail and tuna, the seriola and tuna uh, projects in Australia and also the sea bass and sea brim projects in Europe are what you would call offshore because they're in very exposed waters, deeper water, further offshore. 
Uh, there was also tremendously exciting developments happening now in China and Norway, where structures such as this, which is designed on the, the, the principles of an oil rig, and it's about the size of an oil rig. These are now being deployed to grow fish out in the middle of the North Sea and offshore in China, which is the, the, the hurricane or typhoon, as they call them, the, the Typhoon Alley. So these stru structures are very large. They take up to one and a half million fish uh, and they're very robust. They're built to withstand uh, North Sea storms and hurricanes. But of all this work that is happening around the world, we like to think that Hawaii has a, a tremendous opportunity and we can bring a lot to these developments here because of the attributes that we have here. So what are the, these attributes? Well, it's the weather. Hawaii is very famous for its weather and that also has impact on uh, offshore aquaculture. It's the water quality, uh, which I'll speak more about what those attributes are that we consider in water quality. It's the pedigree that we have here, the history that we are developing in offshore aquaculture in Hawaii. And then it's the poke, which is, okay, I'm a sucker for alliteration, uh, but it, it's Hawaii's seafood, uh, passion for seafood. And, and that makes it a, a, a tremendous location to be pioneering these developments. Just the weather, I think Hawaii is uh, famous for the north and northwest winter storm surf, which is really challenging. And so there are limitations there as to where you would be doing off. You wouldn't want to be in a, a farm site that was exposed to those storms. And you also don't want to be uh, exposed to the, the, the trade winds because that just makes working a little bit more challenging, a little bit more uncomfortable. But in these islands then, there, there are still tremendous uh, stretches of coastline which are available both in, in uh, West Hawaii, in around Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and uh, on the south shore of Oahu. And when you look at the counterpoint, there's a lot of other places where people are doing offshore aquaculture, which are really challenging. This is perhaps the closest analog to Hawaii in the Atlantic, the Canary Islands. And these are the sorts of sea conditions that they're having to, to work in, in, in the Atlantic there. And when you compare that with what we're exposed to here in Kona, for example, and this shows here just north of Keahole Point, it shows the offshore farm site that we had originally developed back here in 2005 when we were Kona Blue Water Farms. That farm site transitioned 2009, 2010. It was taken over by another company. That was, you'll remember the global financial crisis and there were some real financial challenges for all of us then. Another company came in and took that over and they've been operating that since then as Blue Ocean Mariculture. And this site has been producing since 2008 around 500, 600 tons a year of the Kona Kampachi or the Hawaiian Kanpachi as it's now branded. And this is a deep water site, over 200 feet of water. It's only a half mile offshore and I'll speak some more to that in a minute, but there's very brisk currents through there and there's a sand bottom. And from an ecological perspective, that's really critically important for offshore aquaculture. But so it's, it's just a half mile offshore. People are gonna say, well, is that really offshore aquaculture? Well. To the west of this farm site, the next nearest landfall is China, and that's 5,000 miles away. And to the south, directly south of here, the next landfall is Antarctica, and that's 8,500 miles away. So you get out there on a bouncy day and it really does feel like the open ocean. But tellingly, most days out there, it's Kona, and this is the sort of sea state, okay, this is perhaps a particularly favorable sea state, but most of the days of the year, you're able to work comfortably on this farm site. And that's really critically important, both for early stage R&D projects, but also then as you're scaling up commercially. So water quality, what, what do I actually mean when I think about, when I speak about water quality? As a marine biologist, uh, one of the critical factors here is turbidity, which that essentially turbidity just means stuff in the water, how clear the water is, and how much particulate matter there is there. And you can see from this image on the Kona farm site, the water is crystal clear. This is open ocean water quality, really truly blue water. And then it's water temperature. Yes, you will notice that this gentleman snorkeling here on the farm site doesn't have a wetsuit. There are very few places where people are working in offshore aquaculture where you'll have water temperatures in the range that we have uh, that are favorable to diving that provide just 
more ease of access to the net pens and to your fish. And then there is the geographical location, the isolation that we experience here. It is, it's challenging when you want to go to a conference on the mainland, but hey, now we can all do Zoom conferences. But it's a tremendous advantage uh, when you're looking at this as a, as a development site for projects and, and commercialization. So turbidity is important both for safety. When you are diving, you want to be able to uh, see the, the net pen, see your other workers, and see the fish. Uh, so for safety, it's important. But it's also because there's not a lot of stuff in the water, you don't get a lot of biofouling. There's not a lot of food in the water for the filter feeding oysters or barnacles or mussels or seaweeds that will cover uh, net pens in, and any other uh, material out offshore in other locations. So the beautiful blue water here, because it's essentially a desert, that means that there's very little other competing growth on your structures there. The water temperature, as I'd said, it's important for safety. There are places where people are doing offshore aquaculture, for example, the North Sea in Norway, where if you fall into the water when you are unprotected, if you are not wearing a dry suit, you die in somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes. You fall into the water in Kona and you keep your head above water and you're fine. You're fine. Somebody will eventually come, come and find you. It's also really important for the growth performance of the fish that generally, as a general rule of thumb, growth of animals is tightly linked, correlated to, to, to the, the temperature, the, the ambient temperature there. And there's very low seasonality here. In Hawaii, we have water temperatures, I'm sorry, I'm gonna work in centigrade here, but uh, 24 to 26 and a half degrees centigrade in the offshore waters. And that's a very, very low range. Uh, and that's a tremendous advantage for fish growth here. And the geographical location, as I said, the isolation here is also a tremendous advantage in terms of the biosecurity. You see that in companies uh, that come here to set up operations such as the oyster companies and the clam companies that are working uh, in, at, at Nelha and also shrimp improvement systems, the selective breeding company that comes and does their shrimp broodstock production here because of the, the isolation, the biosecurity that that brings. The offshore projects that we've had, uh, as I said, the, the Moi farm that was off Oahu, operated between 2001 and 2014. The Natural Energy Lab in Kona, where Blue Ocean Mariculture and Forever Oceans and Ocean Era are all based, and the Hatch is based as well. Uh, the Blue Ocean Mariculture site is just north of there. The Forever Ocean site is down, as it said, about six miles offshore of Kerhole. We have just recently obtained the permits to go and develop an offshore macroalgae culture trial site uh, just uh, south of Honokahau Harbour. And I think it's also important to highlight liquid robotics, which are based out of Kauai High, but they're also, uh, they work on the autonomous drones that are used for water quality monitoring, uh, ocean monitoring throughout the globe. And they're based out of Kauai High. Hawaii is also then a, a springboard for expansion naturally, nationally. We have a, a, a permit pioneering process underway in the Gulf of Mexico that we are calling Valella Epsilon. Again, it's a small scale demonstration project continuing on from the Valella projects that we had here in Hawaii. That's going to be 40 miles offshore of the, the Sarasota coast there. And then it's also Hawaii is a, a springboard for global growth. And we've seen this in aquaculture, in oyster culture and shrimp culture and a number of other industries. And now in offshore aquaculture, we were able to develop a offshore project down in the Sea of Cortez, Campachi, Mexico. Uh, it looks like a mill pond, but this is four miles offshore in waters that's over 200 feet deep. This is essentially offshore aquaculture as well. The Natural Energy Lab that I'd spoken of earlier, it's, it's a, this phenomenal blend. For those of you that don't know it, it, to my mind, it brings together sort of the Jules Verne aspects and the, the Warren Buffett aspects of life. And then Greta Thunberg and the environmental focus. There's a little bit of Jacques Cousteau in all of us that work down here, as well as a little bit of Guy Rogelius and hopefully some Steve Jobs. We, uh, we do, everybody that works here at the Natural Energy Lab looks at what is going to be the application of your research. This is not an academic institution. It's a phenomenal R&D company here, uh, R&D community here. Uh, and it lends itself very much to offshore innovation because we're able to pump oceanic water directly onshore. 
and then you have the, the offshore uh, offshore waters that are literally within a stone's throw of the coastline here. There's also, I've spoken earlier, of the community support. There's tremendous social license here in Kona. When we were doing the, the Valella projects, I remember at one stage we had to remove one of the demonstration net pens because our permit was only for a short period of time. And I had a fisherman come up to me in the harbour here and say, grab me by the metaphorical lapels and say, please don't take that net pen out. That's the best fishing that I've had in my life because these offshore pens act as great fish aggregating devices. And so the local fishing community has learned to really love what offshore aquaculture can bring. There's also at the Natural Energy Lab that there's an umbrella EIS for permitting through the onshore operations. And there's also moves to start to move that umbrella EIS to also allow for small scale R&D projects offshore here. And I'll also mention Hatch, that Hatch chose the Natural Energy Lab out of all the other places on the planet where they wanted to be. And I think it's because of this innovative startup mentality there in the Nelha community. And then there's, there's the, the Polke. There are very few places in the planet where there is such an appreciation for the varieties of seaweed. So this was uh, when we're looking at developing offshore culture of seaweed, Hawaii is the ideal location to start this up and to focus on the higher value foods we're also looking long-term at feeds and fuels and fertilizers and also as a way to mitigate carbon footprint. But the, 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 the food aspect of Hawaiian culture and, and the importance of seaweed here locally it is a tremendous asset when you're looking at developing these sorts of projects. And then there's other species that might be considered minor species elsewhere, but which are very highly appreciated here in Hawaii, such as the moi, and also the Nanue, this is the herbivorous reef fish that I spoke of earlier, it eats seaweed and it's very highly prized here as a uh, ingredient in polke, as one of the, the prime polke fish. And there's the Kampachi, which is uh, found throughout the world, but which we've been able to develop a real brand for here as a high grade sashimi quality fish. And it really is phenomenal. It's been a real privilege to be able to grow that fish and pioneer that, the, the culture of that species in offshore waters here. There's one other thing that we often don't appreciate about what Hawaii offers, and that is the money. We often feel like we're sort of the, the redheaded stepchild in terms of startup financing, but there are some aspects of uh, R&D financing here in Hawaii which are highly advantageous, and we should be grateful for those. We can receive federal grants. Our company has obtained Sultan Stall Kennedy grants through, through NOAA, and also the macroalgae work that we are uh, focused on, on uh, comes from ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for the Department of Energy. And the access to that federal money is critically important to driving the innovation in this industry there. And then we also have access to the SBIR grant program, particularly for us, for, for NOAA and for USDA and for the National Science Foundation. And kudos to our state legislators. If any of the, them are listening, the state HTDC match program for the SBIR grants is absolutely critical to us being competitive. When with you have a phase one grant, you want to be able to transition to a phase two grant. That has been the key element in a number of our, our research projects there. And we really appreciate that there. And then there's also, I think, a growing awareness about the, the potential for aquaculture. And that's very keenly felt here in Hawaii. And so we have had Silicon Valley uh, impact investor groups and Hawaii investors that have been part of our commercial development. 